Hello there. Welcome Very to another Real Academy session. This week I was supposed to have a lovely sci-fi filter on, but my camera just decided to throw its dummy out. But I am also wearing one of my new favourite t-shirts. It has lots of sci-fi ships on it and uh, years of production. Hopefully go through that in a bit. But today we'll be talking about sci-fi, which is absolutely about me. Because I am Thai. And our guests are... <laughs> what? Ben, um, Dr. Chloe Faraha, Tigger, Raven Cochran and David Gray Hammond. Uh, can we each give a prescription? I can start. Um, my name is Raven. I use she, her, hers, and these are hers. Um, I have dark brown, dark brown hair, long and curly. I wear glasses, light brown skin, wearing a blue shirt. David? I'm David Gray Hammond. I am a white person of Mediterranean descent. I have a beard, a shaved head, thick rim glasses, a lip piercing, and a pink ear tunnel, and a red t-shirt. Lovely Tigger. Uh, hi, I am Tigger. Um, white, blue top, maroon kind of shirt underneath, um, shaven head, short beard, wear glasses sometimes, but not when I'm on these, and it's uh, he and him. I also have a shaven head, if you didn't notice. Chloe? Hello. I keep having to adjust myself because the cat decided they want to be in this live for some reason. So they're here. Um, so I am a white person with a shaved head, giant glasses, wearing one of my favourite jumpers, which is yellow with a laying down potato person that says, current mood, potato. Um, and I use they, she pronouns. And Ben is a young white male with dark blonde hair and a blue t-shirt with a bookcase on the left and a window on the right. And he's very lovingly growing a beard just for me. Right, so let's talk about sci-fi then. Um, I'm, I really want to talk about sci-fi because I think we all love that. I'm really, it's one of my greatest passions so i just want to resolve to geek out on that but i also want to find out why if we can i've seen um, i've noticed that new divergent people tend to grow gravitate towards science fiction and why is that chloe this is very fun being a guest i like being a guest um <laughs> so I think there's loads of reasons, but I'm going to give my reason. And I think I've put down that it's to get lost in lots of intricate worlds, because a lot of the things I like are just these huge worlds with all these amazing intricate characters. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I'm going to talk about a bit, which we're going to get into, is it technically sci-fi or is it fantasy and what's the difference? Um, but the Dark Tower stroke gunslinger novels by Stephen King which he started when he was 19 um, and it incorporates actually lots of his different books that aren't even part of that main series as it were um, so these amazing intricate worlds that you can get lost in uh, where science and ordinary or misfit people prevail um, which I think is probably quite important for a lot of us who've maybe felt really isolated and ostracized and things so it's really nice to see the misfits that get to have these amazing adventures or develop superpowers or um, whatever it might be. Yeah, that's what drew me in, the um, escapism and the, the almost limitless possibilities of what you, you yourself can be. You can be that character, you can be that one, you can be that one, you, know, you can be a multitude of, of all different characters together. I think the escapism drew me in, but what keeps me there is um, a lot of it makes you kind of look inwards at yourself and think about what what is my role in the future that could come. 
at least that it is for me. <laughs> I don't I don't know that I've really associated my love for sci-fi with neurodivergence, but I think like what draws me to sci-fi, especially to Star Trek, because that like that's my well, like, well that, that's my greatest love as far as sci-fi is concerned, is that it gives me a hopeful vision for the future, like that we can come out on the other side of all the problems we have right now with something better and beautiful, and I think that holding on to that hope is really important for me. I think. Yeah, that does seem to be a common theme in sci-fi. That it, it, no matter how bad it is in the series or, or films, there's, there's that hope at the end. I see. I, I have that as well. I mean, again, I know my generation. Sorry, but I can remember. Um, I can just remember seeing Star Trek early on, which would have been maybe the early seventies. I remember things like, you know, Stingray, Fireball XL five being drawn to those young sixers. They were. It was just a better world to be involved in. And um, and for me as well, very much that bit about Star Trek. Like my Star Trek was the first biggie for me, Star Trek and Doctor Who, I think. And it was just that fact that it's better than where I was then. And it was just a world I could wrap myself into. I had books, I could take to TV shows. It became a place of safety and security, which which I just yeah been in love with ever since. Star Trek got me through some, I think, some really dark times in my life where I was going through a lot. And that like hope, hopeful vision of the future, I think, is is a really important part of that. It, it taught me a lot as well. It taught me about politics and even religion, and especially in Star Trek, it covers a, a multitude of topics and gender. They, they would have um, non-binary and. I don't know if it exclusively say trans, but it was, you know, characters like Jadzia Dax were the host, mm. they would change genders. But I remember on Next Generation, um, Riker had a relationship with um, a person that, oh, how would I describe them? They, they didn't have genders, they just were people. Season three of, Dis of Star Trek Discovery actually introduces a. Um, specifically um non-binary trans character two actually um what was it there was something else i was going to say about star trek um star trek is also the reason that i went into the sciences like i like it we like Star Trek has been like a really an inspiration for me, like to go and study physics, for example. And like I studied in university, like I'm trying to go into as a career. Um, like I remember one time, I I was watching Star Trek. I was when I was a kid, and I like out of curiosity, I googled, would it be like whether it would actually be possible to build a warp drive? And the answer I got was maybe. And that's that, that has into, kept right? me going for a long time. <laughs> yeah, NASA are looking into possibilities of warp drive. Yeah, but yeah. NASA personnel, a lot of them do attribute why they went into engineering and work at NASA because of Star Trek. Yeah, a lot of engineers became engineers because of Scotty. Yeah. But that's the other advantage to. Uh science fiction isn't it is the fact that the thing especially star trek things you that, that you've seen in science fiction have actually become a reality it's it, it it's it's so much more than just fiction like it's it's speculation on the future and in some cases it really is becoming reality yeah Art imitates life and vice versa. I'd say at the moment we might be delving into the Star Wars dystopian route. But... And I'll speak Ben's words here, which says, um, a lot of the things I watch have a touch of potential realism, which makes me feel like I can easily imagine it happening and therefore feel more connected to the universe, the plot or the characters. 
And I'm like, do you like Marvel? <laughs> Where's the realism? That's ben answers I'm, angrily. <laughs> that's something I wanted to talk about. Like, where's the line between science fiction and fantasy? And there is a lot of science fiction in Marvel, a hell of a lot. Ben says it's everywhere without yeah. giving any examples, but sure. <laughs> Isn't there a quote, though, something about any sufficiently advanced technology is indistingu indistinguishable from magic? Something yeah. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Yeah. I think that was think Arthur Clark. Any given, any given thing that we have achieved with science in the modern era would have looked like witchcraft to a medieval peasant. Hmm. So I, I guess in a way there isn't really a boundary between science fiction and fantasy because you know, depending on how far into the future you're speculating, you're imagining things that seem impossible by today's technology. Like in, in Marvel, on Earth, they see the Asgardians as magical beings. They use magic, whereas the Asgardians say, no, it's just science. But they're just so more, much more advanced. What I like about Marvel in particular, though, is that the characters are relatable. Like, they have... Okay... You know, it's um, it's superheroes, so maybe not a hundred percent relatable on that front, unless you can lift a bus. Um, but the characters are really relatable. They they have similar struggles and concerns to everyone else, but they then also have this huge pressure to try and save people. You know, and uh, it's I don't know. I I find it interesting looking at the way the characters respond to the pressures on them. I think it's interesting because the viewpoint I have is, and I'll do it again, I grew up when um, the, the, the amount of, of science fiction and fantasy you get your hands on was limited. It was book form. So a lot of it was people you said like uh, Arthur C. Clarke and Heinlein and, and, and um, Philip K. Dick and other authors like that, which I was really into and loved. And then it started to manifest itself on television which there was, what, was only three, three channels, I think, in those days? And then the others joined on. And then the explosion. Because when I, when I was younger, being a geek was, like, one of the reasons why I got picked on at school. I had an R2-D2 cover on my, like, maths book. Boom. I was done for, yeah? Whereas now, there's that, there's almost, the growth of the industry is such, um, and it's so accepted that, you know, if you don't have, like, Marvel wallpaper or, like, some aspects of science fiction, then... Um, you kind of like, you know, not in with the crowd, whatever that is. But I think from my viewpoint, it's the it's that journey where I saw it talk about, you know, the politics, the the religion aspects, the the inclusion aspects. All of that to me was a journey I had from those early years in books. I then seen stuff like Star Trek and just any room Doctor Who as well, where it started to change my narrative. And like I said earlier on, it was just it was just a place where I was safe. It was I could just shut out that outside world. And I immersed myself in books and TV shows. And I've been amazed by the explosion of just awesome, amazing stuff out there. And I can't believe at the moment, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm alive in such a time where there's so much amazing stuff out there. In fact, some, some weeks I'm, I'm overloaded. There's so much good stuff to watch. I don't read it as I used to, but it's amazing to see that progression. But for me, that, that mirroring of what's happened with aspects of society and how we've kind of, you know, some, some aspects of like Star Trek and other shows have pulled us along, like the amount of people joining NASA and people like Michelle Nichols and, and James Doohan becoming ambassadors for, you know, engineer agencies and science agencies and NASA and stuff like that. I think it's made a huge difference to the planet. I think that's just been incredible. I'm really lucky that I feel like I, I kind of grew with that in my understanding. It certainly for me was a, an absolute place to, to be safe and to, to escape from everything else that was going on. I ask, what is yes, Chloe? Thank you. <laughs> um, I think because so I obviously wanted to do this for a while, and so we've talked about different things in the lead up to this. Um, 
And I think sci-fi and fantasy can get away with highlighting issues and things like that or normalising things that should be normal anyway. Um, and the reason I say that is, so my all-time favourite sci-fi thing um, is Red Dwarf. If you don't know what Red Dwarf is, but size like, you're already talking about it, sure. Um, can I, I'm going to share my screen because everyone might not know what Red Dwarf is, particularly if they're um, in the States. So Red Dwarf came out in the late 1980s. So I was born in 1984. And it was literally my favorite thing, my first thing, if you like, that I was really interested in. And I always wanted, um, you know, merchandise. I wanted to create, recreate one of Dave Lister's, one of the main characters, um, you know, bomber jackets, which I'm doing now. <clears throat> but actually what I want to talk about is, this is the late 1980s and there's four characters because basically it's three million years into the future and human race has been wiped out and the only human that is left is literally just like this space bum who's just disgusting and a slob and he's <laughs> literally the last human alive um and it's just him a hologram of his dead bunk mate a, a humanoid type creature that evolved from cats called cat and um, originally it was just the four of them was uh, with the fourth character being the hologram and then later they got a fifth character who's the robot um, Crichton but it for out of the four characters in the late 1980s two of them were black and it was sci-fi and it was just this I've you know I've looked at documentaries and all sorts relating to Red Dwarf and that was really ahead of its time doing that and I absolutely adored Dave Lister, who's the main black character, and I was just in love with him as like a five-year-old. <laughs> um, and it just brought in the normalcy of diff those different characters, of like having two key black characters that were part of this amazing show. I th I think one one of my favorite favorite characters, like uh, up this alley, is. Um, LeVar Burton playing Geordi LaForge on in Star Trek The Next Generation. I think like him in that role, Nichelle Nichols as Lieutenant Uhura in the original series are just so iconic and so important. Like even today, still those roles and that representation is so important. But in the sixties, it was unheard of. You know, she, yeah, she, 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 I think there's one scene where she takes over a part of the bridge during one of the episodes, and it was unheard of. And she she recreates this famous story where she was thinking, you know what, I've had enough, and she goes to a restaurant somewhere or a meal or something, and somebody goes, "Oi, Martin Luther King wants to say hello," and he comes up and he says, "Wow, you know, I really love the show," and so on. And she goes, "I'm thinking of leaving." And he goes, "No, don't, because what you're portraying is incredible and a role model for so many people." And that's what I love about sci-fi. It pushes that narrative. It pushes the boundaries of where we should be as a society. And occasionally we follow, which is just gorgeous. That scene with Uhura where she um, took the helm to pilot the ship, they purposely put the camera on her for longer than they would normally because they knew it was such an important yep. scene yep. to have like, not only just a woman, but a black woman yeah. piloting the most famous starship at the time. I think that's what's great about sci-fi. That, but also, I mean, I know we're hogging on Star Trek a bit, but think of that era, the sixties. Yeah, you had an American, a Scotsman, an alien, an, an Asian, a Russian, and an individual of color on a bridge. Now, wow, you know what I mean? That was just that was a beautiful thing to see, and that's why I think I fell for that original series so much. And it was Lucille Ball who kept it going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going yeah, to be yeah. cancelled after the first season. You see, yeah. she basically took over the company or created her own company, production company, and says, "No, it's staying." Yeah, the, we have Lucille Ball to thank for the fact that Star Trek was an, is, was ever anything other than a cult TV show. Hmm. Before um, Chloe started talking about um, Red Dwarf, I wanted to ask what was people's first um, introduction to 
sci-fi really what was their first love is it red dwarf chloe <laughs> for me, for me yeah. I think it was star oh. wars oh. i think it was star wars for me the new hope you must have uh you're younger than me so you would have seen that what, mid late 80s um i saw it because i was born 1990 so what? <laughs> so i i saw it i was very young it was early to the, i it was around about mid 1990s probably talking somewhere between 94 and 96 when i saw it for the first time it's one of my earliest memories actually is seeing star wars Raven, what, what was your first love? As is sci sci-fi, um, I think it really was Star Trek that it was my entrance to sci-fi as a genre. Um, they were like, and I, like I've Star Trek is where I started, but I've like read read the genre like fairly widely, read and watched. Uh, I was really into Doctor Who for a long time. Um, I've read, I've read some High and Line. I've, um, I have a copy of Dune around somewhere that I've never actually managed to get to. <laughs> I think uh, Dune's influence is quite underrated. It's it influenced Star Wars and I think Star Trek as well. Tigger, I mean. What was your first love? Was it Star Trek? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Because um, I do feel, I mean, Ben just put down, I, I feel super young. Yeah, I don't. Um, to, to, I, mean, my, I can remember because I can remember the cartoon shows. I can remember the puppet shows like Thunderbirds and stuff like that. But really, really the one that got me was Star Trek, the original series. That was, I can remember films like, the, you know, um, Forbidden Planet and stuff like that, which had a great influence on Star Wars, Star Trek as well. But it was Star Trek, sorry, Star Trek that really pulled me in, that really made me. I was buying all the novels, I was buying the technical manuals, I was getting models, and I can remember that from a very, very early age. So the original series was the one that just, there was lots of stuff around before then, I remember. The original series was the one that just captivated me, and I became just hyper focused on and loved, and still do. Ben? Is Dr. Chloe reading for Ben? Yeah, so I was getting echoes. Anyone else hearing us twice? I was like, have I got us open somewhere else? No. Yeah, I'm definitely still getting an echo. It's very strange. Hold on. I'm just going to check whether I need to close stuff. I might have to leave and come back again. Let's close that. Um, so Ben says, I went through phases of things. I remember watching Doctor Who quite young at the end of Christopher Eccleston's series and all the way through David Tennant and Matt Smith. Yeah, Doctor Who, definitely one of my one of my loves as well. But again, I think that was dependent on when I started watching it. So I'm much more in loved like Eccleston, Tennant and Smith, whereas Tigger liked things from when you were younger. And we've obviously had our, our first female, well, technically, our first proper female doctor. And we're about to get um, a black Doctor Who, um, which is sad it's taken until 2022, 2023. Um, but it's still nice. And the actor's amazing as well. So I'm quite mm. excited about that. So I might get back into Doctor Who again because I didn't, I stopped watching from Capaldi. I would like to go back and revisit Capaldi because I kind of lost interest then. But my personal first love, yeah, was Star Trek again. <laughs> but I remember always loving things like um, Lost in Space, Forbidden Planet, and well, the old black and white stuff. Um, uh, what was the the day the Earth st stood still? Oh, the original, gorgeous. Yeah. Um, what Tigger's got there in the background, Hal, um, Space Odyssey, two thousand and one. 
But yeah, actual Star Trek. Um, it was we were on holiday in uh, Portugal in 1987, and I was seven. Um, and it was my first time having access to Sky TV, and I was so lucky enough to be there when the first episode of Next Generation aired, 28th of September 1987, and that was it. I was just hooked. And as soon as I got home, I badgered my dad to get Sky so that I could carry on watching it. My first exposure to Star Trek was actually one of the reboot movies, Into Darkness, in 2013, which my, my dad took me to see that movie, and I had never seen anything Star Trek before that. And that got me interested, and I went and started checking out the various shows on Netflix. And then um, it didn't take me long to, to look back again at Into Darkness and think, what the hell were they doing? <laughs> yeah, when I first watched the reboot films, I really liked them. But then you watch them again, you think, this is just nonsense. <laughs> yeah, the, the only one of the reboot films that I've really enjoyed thoroughly was the last one, Beyond, that came out in 2016. I thought that one was really well done compared to the first two. Yeah, that was far, far more like the original series. It felt like an like an episode of the old of the, the old show. Yeah. Ben also says um, I have tons of star the Star Trek models I collected from the weekly magazines and Batmobiles and Marvel chess pieces. Me and magazine collectibles were a recipe for disaster as a hoarder kid. Um, and Ben also says I absolutely loved Into Darkness with Benedict Cumberbatch. I mean, the action is great, but the I, science part is very... It, it's great as an action movie, and like yeah. Benedict Cumberpatch is a fine actor. I just thought that he was a very strange choice to cast for Khan. In, in hindsight, I, didn't think, I wasn't thinking about this at the time because I'd never seen the original series or The Wrath of Khan. Um, but I think Benedict Cumberpatch was a really strange casting choice for Khan. I think it's just because he's got good range. So I think we went with the acting chops. It felt than... like them kind of whitewashing Khan. Yeah. yeah Especially like that given that he was like that he was portrayed by Ricardo Montalban originally. Yeah, was... And I think I think in Star Trek Canon, I believe Khan was supposed to be Indian. Yeah. Which weird that they had a Mexican guy play an Indian character, but <laughs> that's supposedly why you don't see so many Indian or Asian um, people in Star Trek because in Khan's time he wiped out I think about a third of the Earth population. So, but really, it's just racism. <laughs> yeah. Every time somebody talks, it reminds me of another thing of like sci-fi fantasy that I love that I'm adding to my like list of things. Um, but that just made me think of the issues of them messing about in adaptations or actually just from the get-go. So I absolutely love Short Circuit. Um, yeah. yeah, exactly. And I couldn't, I forgot about that one. So I've added that one. So like Short Circuit, actually anything. I like adore 80s. Short Circuit. Yeah, it's one of Short my favorite circuit, movies. Flight of the Navigator, Ooh. Batteries Not Included. Like, they wow. hold up. They are amazing sci fi. Um, the thing I wanted to highlight, though, was um, a white guy playing a, an Indian guy with a terrible accent in Short Circuit. Like, that was a travesty. That was not necessary. Yeah. As a kid, well, I, I, I was pretty really young when I saw that movie. movie. I don't remember that, but I believe you that it's there. As a kid, when I saw that, I thought that was an Indian person. I'd never, because being from Cumbria in a small town, um, the, the, the diversity is very small. To this so day, that, my my family quotes Johnny Five, and like, um, like the no disassemble line. <laughs> all the time or like one of us will be making pancakes and and uh, um, and then just say out of the blue still lumpy <laughs> i have a vivid memory of that film and in, in the end where the, the van gets blown up and you think he's been destroyed with it i bowled my eyes out 
Um, spoiler alert, but I mean, it's been like 30 years. <laughs> but yeah, all, and Cocoon, oh. uh, sci-fi, like stuff from the 80s. Actually, 80s was good. 80s was good Real? for sci-fi. Yeah. Um, E.T. Sorry, um, E.T., yeah. Uh, um, third Kind, what's it called? Encounters of the Third Kind. I think one and of I think that this is also highlighting why it's so important to get it right. So like I say, Short Circuit, it, it was a travesty to, to cast a white person as a really stereotyped Indian accented person. So that was really bad. But there's lots of instances where they've actually done it, done things well. So like, I'm going to go back to Red Dwarf. But, you know, I grew up in a really small um, town. Um, I remember the first black student in my school and being really interested because I was like, oh, this is interesting. This is somebody different because as autistic young people, we're just like, this is interesting, right? We're not, and lots of children in general typically aren't prejudiced, they're just curious. But I'd already seen representation in my favourite show. Mm. And that's also really important for people, I think. But I think that's what science fiction does best is it puts a mirror upon society and it makes some aspects of society want to do better. And again, going back to Star Trek again, you had that bit where, you know, the, it was it was totally unbelievable to see that mixture of individuals upon a bridge, you know, of, of the most important, you know, spaceship, starship in the Federation and such. And that's what I love about things. Red Dwarf, I adored Red Dwarf. But that's what I like about some aspects of science fiction is there's the there's the physics bit which I adore because I'm that kind of a geek as well. But sometimes that mirror up upon society and pushing yeah. us to do better is something I I I've, I've really drawn towards. Sci-fi and Star Trek is a great vehicle to like compa compare to what is going on in society. And you can do that without expressive, you know. Ex specifically saying that this is what's going on and i think they got away with it so to speak because it is science fiction yeah you see what i mean so they push the envelope and people have gone oh it's a sci-fi show not yeah. really looking at the content like that when they lingered the camera on you know, michelle nichols her character and so on stuff like that i think is being able to push which i think has been just brilliant i don't think sci-fi gets enough credit really it's always on like awards and things and um when people are like critics and that, they always discount the um, the sci-fi films. Galaxy Quest, yeah, they, they still try to get a sequel done for that. I don't think it personally happened, but I think they were yeah. about to, and then sadly, yeah, Rick. I uh, feel like I feel like there's a lot of creative writing professors out there who really look down on sci-fi and like dismiss it as genre fiction and then then ignore it which is really unfair like there, yeah. there's a lot to work with there there's there's a, there's a lot of a lot of deeper meaning yeah it can be very philosophical. a lot of a lot of people unfairly dismiss there's a lot of philosophical questions and answers in sci-fi and yeah it, just, it doesn't get enough credit there's um I mean, we've talked a lot about um, space-based sci-fi, but I like some of the stuff that is kind of set more in this era. Um, like I was mentioning before we went live, um, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. People don't think of it as sci-fi, but if you think about what it is, you know, the premise is literally that this company exists that can erase memories from your brain. And I... It makes you think a lot, you know, because you've got these characters who are trying to erase each other from their memory. And it's it's actually quite an uncomfortable film at times because you're like, yeah, you know, it's it, it makes you face up to what people can be like. And uh, it's... It's a really awkward conversation to have actually that film because i think a lot of us can think back to times when we would have liked to have erased certain people from our memory but it raises a lot of questions it does have that parallel with current society of um 
portraying like this utopian thing when actually it's it's more dystopian i guess yeah. that might yeah because to, to echo what david said that made me just think of like black mirror like black mirror has got lots of sci-fi episodes and they're all highlighting issues in our society um and so yeah i think they can push a lot of the social moral philosophical issues and discussions and, and ben says here um i did a philosophy essay on a scene in captain america civil war um any feel free to add a little bit about the philosophy around what uh, what was the philosophical issue potentially in that scene or a, the scene you're talking about I'm trying to remember, yeah. oh men in black oh my god there's so many that i didn't even think to add to my list like i've even now just googled um science fictions of the eight like of the 80s there are so many amazing sci-fis of the 80s particularly i put ben, in the chat earlier blade runner oh, ben's, blade runner. ben's oh. comment about writing an essay about that scene and um captain america reminded me that when i was in university i wrote an essay for um for one of my classes analyzing jadzia dax as a trans character in like and in, like in and of herself and also like the whole like structure uh, like around like trill symbionts and who gets to have them and who doesn't i wrote an essay analyzing that as being representative of the like gatekeeping structures surrounding access to trans healthcare in the 80s and 90s mm. like there are some like there are some specific episodes like there like there's the episode where jadzia is mentoring um a candidate for joining like do like um and ends up i think and i think she ends up i can't remember if she ends up projecting him or not but it was this whole thing, like this this whole structure of like proving that you're worthy enough to be joined, and then there's this secret that um, that that like half of the trail population is physically capable of joining, and they mm -hmm. have this whole structure around it to prevent like a rush on the symbionts, basically. I think <laughs> if you think about sorts of films or like non-sci-fi fantasy type films but still fiction or tv shows or books or whatever it might be or even cartoons i mean look at the ridiculous backlash we have seen the fact that they have a black um actress playing a mermaid in the live action of little mermaid um but i feel like we we don't necessarily see that kind of backlash because of the diversity is expected in sci-fi and fantasy. And that's why I say I think it's quite a beautiful thing to be able to give that representation and talk to some of those issues that are echoed in real life. Like, um, oh, another, another amazing sci-fi, District 9. District 9 was amazing. So District 9, for those who haven't seen it, go and see it, it go and see it. <laughs> see it if you've got to find, find it on like netflix or whatever um were these alien creatures who are in refugee camps and it's demonstrating apartheid in um in in africa in south africa um and people were more able which is saying a lot about a lot of human beings more able to empathize with a, an alien creature than they would be necessarily with the actual instance with apartheid. No, no, so I'm not saying that's a good thing, but I'm saying at least it's introducing people to those social issues. But it shows you again how it pushes the curve. I mean, going back again in time, there was Silent Runnings, uh, Silent, which was one of the first movies about the ecological disaster that we're facing. That was early 70s, I think. Um, Soil and Green, you're going to have to Google these. That's an Soil and Green is people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So thank green you for that. People. I, thought, I don't know it. Um, oh, what was the one where... the that push that makes you stop and think about where we are now? And as you say, that acceptance 
because science fiction has pushed that barrier so much in the past and and you know and thankfully it has because that's so important that it does that as part of its its journey and getting out there to, to, to everybody what was the one where they lived in the post-apocalyptic society and they basically had to um sacrifice themselves um when they became 30 i think it was logan's it was right. run logan's run yes logan's run yeah yeah they they had an implanted light or something and when it started flashing that was it your time's up and you have to give up for the greater good I mean, so you, you had all the, the old stuff, like, you know, the day Earth stood still and Forbidden Planet, which is brilliant, and others. And then it was in that, you know, when the, 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 the structure of society started to change in the 60s, you had then a lot of, of very, I think, pertinent, you know, science fiction coming out, not just on television, but especially in the movies, that really pushed us forward. Just wish we'd listened more, really, because some of them were just really very, very ahead of their time. I think it is interesting that, as neurodivergent people, obviously not all of us, not every neurodivergent person is going to love sci-fi and fantasy. What? Um, but lots of us potentially do love it because it is about difference. It's about things that are really out there and, and like I say, it's so it can be escapism. Well. So it could be escapism, but also, like you say, relatable. Is that what you said, Si? Yeah. But you can see the injustices or marginalization going on with that character, it's easy to see. And you can also see what could be this great society that people are trying to show you. I want to be a part of that. I'm just going to read Ben's. So I asked Ben if they could just let me know what the um, philosophical issue was in the scene they were talking about. So Ben says there was a scene between Captain America and Spider-Man where Cap asks what Tony Stark told him about Cap, and he replies, you're wrong, but you think you're right. And I pretty much use that scene to talk about truth of knowledge and the validity of what we are told in relation to morals, depending on what perspective we are on um, or are given. I'm sure that meant a lot more to you, Ben, because I don't know what that relates to. <laughs> I, I do like Marvel. I've watched pretty much maybe not everything, because there's a lot of like series on telly and stuff. Um, Marvel is so underrated, nine. the story writing on that. You were talking earlier about um, District 9, and I, in my head, as you were saying that, I was thinking about Alien Nation, which I think was originally in the 80s, where an alien population basically lands in America, conveniently, it's always America. And then there was this um, conflict between aliens and the humans but it was obviously an analogy for i would presume mostly racism so tanya says i think it exaggerates what happens what's happening sorry with humans probably makes it more understandable hmm. and she's also put a bit about books because because again from my generation way before you know um i, I can remember the television arriving the black and white television arrived when I was like seven or eight or something. But before then, it was R. C. Clarke, it was Heinlein, all the authors I mentioned before, The Stranger in a Strange Land, stuff like that. They were just, I was so drawn to them. Even though some of them, you know, when I was, I was really young, it was difficult to read, but I was so drawn to books at an early age because of the, the fact that I felt more, you know, safer, more accepted there. I could escape from the earth that was around me. So, so very early on, um, you know, the, the authors around at the time, I, I would devour certain authors by you know getting down to the local library and stuff or buying books in second hand shops and so on because there was so much really and, and so many of the things we see now philip k dick especially so many of his little stories have been turned into into really good movies he played one for one yeah and and i think the there's a lot of really good you know the, the growth of science fiction um from the early days of cinema but there's really some really good early books out there as well which has been i think so important Foundation by Asimov comes to mind because that's just been made into a TV series. And uh, Asimov is why are not why are more people not talking about Asimov? Right? <laughs> I was about to, I promise, it's on my list. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, Asimov wrote over 400 books yeah. and essays and short stories and things, he was really pr prolific. Um, and I did a lot of I did all the uh, the robot series and a number of other um, 
like his foundation series and things like that. Um, what I really love is Asimov was writing about robots because he was annoyed at how scared humans were at the idea of robots, at AI, the idea that they were going to be become cruel or rise up against us and all this kind of thing. So when you actually read his books, they are benevolent. They are not necessarily capable because of his three laws of harming, of harming humans. Um, there is one AI character that kind of breaks their programming, but he was writing because he he was annoyed. He was annoyed at the way people were scared about the future of AI. Because he was like, you, it's, it's not going to happen the way we fear mongered. Do you know what sci fi taught me about that, though? Humans aren't scared that robots are going to turn out to be evil. Humans are scared that robots are going to turn out to be just like us. Yeah, that's the same with aliens as well. We demonize aliens, like literally Alien, the film, the movies. I love the series. Yeah. But we're scared of aliens because we think that they're going to be like us. And I think I think um, Libby likes Dune. Yes, Lib Libby loves Dune. Um, I started watching the new film that they've just done. I have not finished it yet because it was quite long, and oh, okay. I got distracted. But um, yeah, it's uh, Dune is they call it the Lord of the Rings of sci-fi, don't they? Yeah, the tripods. Tripods. God, I remember that. That was super. I don't know what this is, but it made me think of another thing that I friggin' loved, which was um, um, ah, oh, the plants that eat you, Triffids. Yeah, the Triffids. Oh, God. Is, the, the, the TV series and, and things is garbage. Don't bother. The book is it. It's literally what would happen. Like, what would humans be like in the days? following a major disaster, a major, um, uh, what is it when? Apocalypse, that's the one. Um, but the actual, yeah. The made me think of War of the Worlds. I just found it fascinating because it was about the psychology of the human beings. Like the actual plants themselves weren't actually as important. They were the catalyst. And then it's about seeing the psychology of human beings and how quickly they fall apart. As I mean, so, so, somebody's put hitchhikers. I can remember yeah. receiving um, cassette tapes in the post because I was, I don't know, 10 or something, wrapped in foil from my brother. So I could live because I was at school when they got shown it, like, like played at 11 o'clock in the morning on Radio 4 or something. And I didn't have a radio at home at the time I had access to. And my brother was sending me cassette tapes when the new episode came out. Everything of hitchhikers I do. I've even got vinyl of hitchhikers. It's so good. And as for June, wow, don't just stop at the first book go on and on and on and you're right it is definitely june at like asimov's foundation to me rivals to stuff like lord of the rings because their complexity and the intricacy and they're just so gorgeous michael Crichton. that's i i know i can't remember a lot of his Jurassic work Park. yeah but is that science fiction or is that that's achievable Honestly, mm. i'd say jurassic it. park is sci-fi yeah they achievable. take sorry say again that's achievable though isn't it mm. I get. I mean, it's still sci yeah, but a lot of sci-fi is, or could arguably be achievable. Like Red Dwarf, when I was watching the documentary re recently, they they tried to make a lot of the stuff they did in Red Dwarf. Red Dwarf, even though it's this these short, like the 20, 25 drive. minute. Okay, not the Holly Hop Drive, but the twenty to twenty five minute episodes where it's just largely about comedy. They still tried to make a lot of it based on actual science. Not the Holly Hop Drive, not some of the yeah. some of the ridiculous plot lines. Um, Marrying someone yeah. like Bigfoot's toe. <laughs> sure. Um, we've now just got into what do we love, haven't we? Really. Oh, right. can, can I just tell some more of my books then? Because books are a huge thing for me. So, because Tanya obviously brought up, what about? books obviously we were talking about films and things and books are huge for me I have to read before I go to bed and maybe lots of neurodivergent are similar neurodivergent people are similar where they really struggle to get their minds to quiet enough to sleep and I definitely do and so I read and my I always read sci-fi or fantasy so fiction 
because I want to escape. I don't want to be thinking about serious things. Um, so like I said, I did the Asimov, um, a lot of the Asimov stuff, but just, just some of the ones that I love in case anyone's interested and they want to go out and look at something really new and interesting. You had the Painted Man series. That was really interesting. That was more fantasy, but that was literally almost like it was like a science and magic at the same time so side so saying that it's almost like the two are the same and in, um it depends on what did you say you and um raven any, it was like any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic yeah um and it's it's literally about there's these demons that come up from the earth and they thought they'd wiped them out um and they used to have all these magic runes that they would put on their doors and stuff and they lost that technology if you like because they thought they'd wiped all these monsters out um, and then the demons come back and the painted man as a child literally starts to ink the runes onto their body and starts fighting them. It's really epic as um, a series, it's very interesting. Um, my absolute favourite that I really got absorbed in was the Dark Tower, like I said, the Gunslinger um, series because it was just such a long run of books as well as bringing in all his other... Um, a lot of his other books that you wouldn't think have any relation to the Dark Tower series, which is very much like a steampunk, Western, sci-fi sort of epic storyline. I um, cowboys and aliens. Potentially. So I've got like a little badge that's going to go on my, the Dark Tower badge, and um, it's going to go on my, my um, Red Dwarf jacket when I make it. Um, but I love that. I got so absorbed in that storyline and it was really sad when it ended because I'd become so part of that world and the way they talked um great science in books so the girl with all the gifts has anyone read or watched the girl with all the gifts I've seen it. the book was better as is as it is the way um but the girl with all the gifts puts reality into the idea of zombies so it uses the science of the zombie ant so the fungus does anyone know about this it's very i i do it's yeah because it's real <laughs> yeah i'm trying to remember what it's called um it's it's like the fungus in the last of us yeah um, the premise for that i'm I'm, tr I'm trying to remember the name i'm gonna google it okay so the science basically it's cordyceps. In reality. sorry what is it cordyceps mushrooms Fun okay. fungi it's a species of cordyceps fungi that infects ants and makes them do freaky zombie shit yeah it basically is in the amazon the ants get this fungi on their little bodies and it basically eats away their brain and then controls the ant to go up to the top of a tree plant itself and then shoot out spores and stuff like this and it genuinely is controlling a dead ant um, and the girl with all the gifts is based on that science that is, you know, that fungus becomes airborne and, and actually um, turns a lot of people into zombies. And I don't typically, typically like zombie things. They freak me out. But I liked this one for the science of it. Um, I think it was really interesting. Um, and then just for some more fun things that are a little bit less freaky because when I'm not in the place for it, I, I like fun things and cute things. So I mentioned to everyone before we came on, um, T. Kingfisher, I love their, their books. And one of them, for instance, is called A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking. And it's where there's lots of like minor mages, like minor wizards and people with minor basic magic. And this particular character, this girl, can um, animate baked goods. And so she uses them. She gets caught up in some you know, trouble and she uses the defensive baking and things. But it's just adorable. And there's she accidentally puts too much magic into the yeast starter that you would like keep. And he's called Bob and he lives in the basement because he's just this big blob of yeast. Um, oh. And the last one I want to mention, um, and then I'll shut up, is the, Lo the Long Way to a Small Angry Planet by Becky Chambers. I actually love all of their books. They are so beautifully written. Um, and I was explaining before we came on, what I love about them is in them, humans are really minor characters or minor aliens, if you like, um, and the different types of aliens. And she brings in, again, sort of social issues or just representation. So, like, there's an amazing um, 
species of alien called Andrisk, um, and there's some others, and I think it's the Andrisk, who change gender um, at will, if you like, um, depending on who they love or who they're attracted to and all this kind of stuff. Um, but the book, that particular one, the premise is they're just everyday mining crew and they create uh, wormholes just for people to travel on. Um, and it's just really beautifully written. The end, I'll stop talking. <laughs> A book I'd like to mention, uh, which I like because the main character, they never say the main character is neurodivergent, but I get big neurodivergent vibes off them, is Artemis by Andy Weir. And um, it's set in the first and only city on the moon called Artemis. And the main character, who's called Jazz, they, um, they, they're just like working class on this city of billionaires. Um, and they they sort of see this opportunity to kind of get one over and uh it's a really easy to read book but it's just nice to read like i i just go back and reread it sometimes because it is just so easy to read even in the way the text is laid out in the book like it's just it's quite accessible not just story wise but the way it's printed as well and um what you were saying about, you know, sometimes you just need to switch your brain off. Like, it's a really fun story, but there's still things to think about in it because it gets into sort of like the politics of socioeconomic class and stuff like that. But actually, if you just want to enjoy a story for the sake of enjoying a story, you can also do that with that book. But Andy Weir is the guy who wrote The Martian and Project Hail Mary, which I still haven't read at the moment. Um, I would like to mention here um, r the Red Rising trilogy, which is kind of um, which is uh, by Pierce Brown, which is kind of revolutionary dystopian sci-fi. Um, but what I really like about it is like where a lot of a, a, with a lot of that like, sort of dystopian sci-fi or fantasy, like you get to the end of the successful revolution and then everybody just lives happily ever after. But what's different with these books is that the author actually delves into how do you, like, how, how do you rebuild, build a new and better society after that, after the revolution? How do you, like, what comes after the revolution is a much harder question than the revolution itself. And I, that's one of the things that I've really enjoyed it for. I think it kind of walks a line between like being sci-fi and, and being more space opera, like in the way that Star Wars is. I think it's, I think the first book came out in 2014 and I think it's my favorite, my favorite modern sci-fi writing. Talking of space opera, um, Battlestar Galactica. I think that was late noughties when it was um, rebooted. So that is that is a fantastic show. It is very was it two writers that were attached to DS9? I think so, yeah. It was I can't remember. There, there was a bit of a Berman, there was a bit of a lawsuit or something between yeah. the DS9 and were copying them or whatever. I can't remember now. I think it was yeah, settled out of show. court, but yeah, there was a credible accusation of the DS9 writers ripping off Battlestar Galactica a little bit. Um I don't know about that, but Babylon Five is just popped into my head. I know that uh, J. Michael Straczynski, who created Babylon 5, he took the story to... Oh, Babylon 5, that's what I was thinking of. Paramount, and yeah, DS9 is a rip-off of Babylon 5. But after the first series, they're very different. I'm very, I adore Babylon 5. To me, it's up there with some of the greats. I know they're I'm in they're rebooting that. that. But they're, they're hopefully, I'm, I'm following him on Facebook and stuff. They're trying to. I absolutely adored it when it came out. Um, the um, graphics are really cool all the time, maybe not so much now, but um, but no, I'd love to see that rebooted. And I loved the the storyline and the fact that it was a story arc of five years, yeah. I think Battlestar Galactica was, was great for that. Yeah, the, great, the, the great. people that followed that were Battlestar Galactica, they did a story arc over five years, really. So, loved it. I think it's kind of sad that some of these amazing things and films, particularly the 80s ones, 
I don't know how many people, like young people at the moment, will ever watch them. And I would not want them to be remade. You cannot remake, like, Short Circuit, Batteries Not Included. It would not, it wouldn't look right. Because they're still amazing when you watch them now. And it's like, how many people must be missing out on them? Because they were, they were so beautiful. I don't um, know if you mentioned it, but Blade Runner, you, that doesn't need remaking. That still stands up now. I've got that on Blu-ray. And, yeah, it... it they remastered it um, about 10 years ago or so, but it's beautiful. It's for a 1980, I can't remember. Is it 1980? It, it, it is one of the best films ever made. It is stunning beyond belief. It's a Philip K. Dick novel, but the book itself is completely different from the movie. But it's still a yeah. great adventure as well. <clears throat> it's like <clears throat> Total Recall, he did that as well, and the um, the book is very different. Yeah. I just want to flag so you've got Paco's comment on the screen, which is because Sai's got this giant mug. Um, and Paco says, The sheer scale of Sai's tea mug reminded me of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Another amazing sci fi of like yeah. 80s, 90s, yeah. 80s, 90s. I would have uh, Well, there were several sequels, so yeah, I think it went into the 90s. But you're, you're right got, in saying there's so much stuff that I remember of that era and before, but because there's so much stuff there now, people may never get to see again, which is which is fascinating. Be sad. I'm gonna, ben, have you seen the, some of the films that we're talking about? You haven't. Whereas Libby, <laughs> Libby is saying, I've seen Flight of the Navigator, which is another one of my comfort films. I love that film because it's also yeah. got Jim Henson um, puppetry in it. And the most adorable, like little aliens and things like that, and just it's just amazing for the time as well. When you look at the ship, it's it's epic. Um, oh, crystal, yeah. So, oh, yeah, and Libby true. says um, my granddad introduced me to it. So yeah, that's. I mean, I'm not a granddad, but I want to be introducing these things to um, people because they're amazing. I was terrified of flights of the navigator as a child, but still watched it because the story was amazing. Something about it really scared me. I don't know what it was to this day, but I loved it. That, um, little, that alien eyeball thing initially is a little bit freaky, but it, yeah. the, voice and the, the mannerism and the, the character is it's yeah. really endearing. I, just kind of, like, oh, sorry, I was going to say, can I, uh, for a second, raise the topic of science fiction in video games? Because Chloe said something um about zombie things and it's a really really good series that asks all kinds of questions like what happens when science is performed without ethics and it looks at eugenics and capitalism and it it, sh it holds this massive mirror up to modern society tigger will know what i'm talking about as soon as i say we did a podcast on it for especially interesting yes. um Great. resident evil yeah yeah um, yeah it is like it raises so many questions about humans pursuit of knowledge and science and the whole thing is it's the whole premise is that this private research organization has just ended the world with this virus that's turning everyone into a zombie and it, it raises questions around eugenics and all sorts and it is it's an amazing game series they did make a series of films with Mila Jokovic, which lots of people don't like. I personally think the films were great if you ignore the fact they're nothing like the games. The films were yeah, the, good as standalone films. There was a recent series as well, and which I really liked. But that's been cancelled, unfortunately. I haven't watched the series yet, but... There was a few iffy episodes, especially with the very huge alligator. Yeah. A bit iffy. But the series and the story and the acting, I really liked it. But Resident Evil, it's it's one of those, it's got quite a big cult following, but it mm -hmm. should be bigger. Like it was it was a really well done piece of science fiction. And it came it, it was a video game first. Like people often forget this one and they're like, you know, oh sci-fi. But like you can tell a story without writing a book or making a film. Like, video games can tell a story as well. And I think that's another reason why science fiction is so popular with the autistic community, because so many of us use video games as a way of escaping the nonsense, <laughs> you know? Um, 
And Resident Evil. Yeah, Resident Evil. I love it. The Clangers. I know. I yeah. actually like that. That makes sense. The Clangers. They're they are kind of sci-fi because they're little alien mice. Um, I'm going with this. I'm 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 going with Tanya's. The Clangers okay. is sci-fi. It's adorable. I just want to flag like Wayne. Wayne is really on it. So we've got yeah, amazing. The Fifth Element. <clears throat> oh, if yes. you are young, and you have not seen The Fifth Element. Oh my God, it's got everything. It's just that's, amazing. That's Mila Jokovic again from uh, yeah. the uh, Resident Evil films. Bada um, boom. What's his name? Um, Gary Oldman. He's brilliant in that. Gary Oldman's yeah. brilliant in everything. Has he even got Blumin Lee Evans? Yeah. Yes, British it's comedian. Yeah. Like British comedian. Um, Wayne again. Logan's Run. Yeah. One that we said before we came on, which is The Matrix, which was just mind blowing when I was a teenager and it came out and I watched it. I literally just watched it because it had Keanu Reeves in it. And then I was like, oh my God, this film is just literally it not literally, figuratively mind blowing because of the not just what they managed to do in terms of the um special effects and all that kind of stuff, but the story and everything. Yeah. Um the way they you the, Maybe um, had a point about this as well. Yeah. So Bobby's mentioned Brazil as well. Another film for me that is Terry Gilliam, which is totally up there as an again. If you get a chance to watch it, it is absolutely incredible and another one of my favourite films ever. It is so just lush in its storytelling. Terry Gilliam, just superb. Somebody also says Button Moon. <laughs> oh. Um. Sorry, I was I was distracted by an email for a That's moment. What we were, we were talking about the Matrix, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I I've thought a lot about that movie. Um, there was a class that I took in university that was a study um, on basically a study on like on trans representation in media from the early '90s to the present, and we didn't actually watch the Matrix in that class but we did talk about it a lot. And during that semester, there was actually a guest speaker who came to um, give a talk at my school about the Matrix and the ways in, in which it is a trans story, which it is and has been from the beginning. Um, like even like the, the, the Wachowski sisters weren't out at the time, but you can still like, if you know what you're looking for, it's all, it's all there. Um, like, in, even like in, in the tiny details, like the fact that the actual, like the, that the, um, you know, the estrogen pills that trans women at, in that era would have been prescribed quite literally was a little red pill. It, it it's, there's just there's so much in that movie, and I I like I want to rewatch it many more times, and like really dig into it. But I'm pretty sure I wrote an essay about the Matrix at some point. The people that have seen the Matrix, if you remember the character Switch, um, they're female presenting with the sharp blonde hair. Uh, when they're in the Matrix, they were meant to be male presenting, and then when they're outside in the real world, they were female presenting. But I can't remember for whatever reason that didn't happen in the film, but it's a shame. In the Matrix, you'd be whatever you want. Black Hole. Yes, yeah, so Wayne, I think we're of the same generation, aren't we? Black Hole, Disney? Is that the one? Yes, the one with the really long spaceship, similar to uh, that. <laughs> Chloe muted. I was just saying, I have to keep adjusting my chair because the cat can't decide whether to sit on my lap or not. No one's mentioned Gattaca yet. <laughs> Gattaca <laughs> is one I haven't seen, but I've been meaning to for a really long time. That's very much about eugenics. And, uh, well, is there an and? <laughs> Especially no. about eugenics. <laughs> yeah, that, that's 
it's, it's, uh, I think a very, a very pertinent topic to us, um, given the, like the history of autism as a diagnosis and how it's been viewed. And just ask his Planet of the Apes sci-fi. I'd say definitely because um, you find out the at the end of the first film that basically uh, the Statue of Liberty is there. So it's a wormhole. Yeah, he's gone into the future. Or okay. like... It now just makes me think of um, oh no, with Rick Moranis, Spaceballs. Oh yeah, which is a which is an amazing comedy. It's it's brilliant, but it's a parody of like, yeah, Star Wars mostly. Star Wars, yeah, yeah, yeah. largely Star Wars, but yeah, I just because they do a bit of a um, uh, a Planet of the Apes call out towards the end. So many people have got some because I asked what were people's you know sort of favourites or ones that they could list. So Terminator, Dark Crystal, we've mentioned Robocop. Well, yes. Um, I had the little action figure of Robocop. Sorry, is that again? I had the little action figure of Robocop. I mean, it used to make him fight He Man. Labyrinth. <laughs> um, Bobby says the last unicorn, which is definitely fantasy. Um, but yeah, so many great ones. I'm trying to think. Oh, this is just okay. Now, <laughs> Idiocracy is a ridiculous comedy from what late 90s, early noughties, maybe. Um, it's got oh, yes. the amazing Terry Crews as the president, but yes. the premise is kind of talking, I guess, to social issues hmm. <laughs> somewhat, but it yeah. is ridiculous. I adore Terry Crews. Everything I've seen him in, I've he's been incredible. Um, and now that now that I know that he's in that, I have to watch it. Oh, it's a great film. Oh, Ben says Men in Black. Yeah, Men in Black is great sci-fi, funny. Um, Stephen says Button Moon counts. <laughs> Um, oh yeah. I uh, I really really want to mention the one I said before uh, we went live because it is such an important film in my life and well it's based on the novel as well. Cloud Atlas. Um, literally, my entire philosophy in life is based on that. Like, and it's got this amazing scene um, called the Revelation of Somni Four Five One. And he goes something like, to be is to be perceived, and so to know thyself is only possible through the eyes of the other. Um, our lives are not our own. From womb to tomb, we are bound to others, past and present, and by each crime and every every kindness, we birth our future. And like when I heard that for the first time, it just changed my entire outlook on life. And uh, I mean, the whole concept of the film and the book is that these characters are being reincarnated across different periods of time and the actions they took in their previous life have a direct impact on the lives that come afterwards and it's just it's a it really difficult a film to watch but because it, it's very complicated but it is it's amazing and it, it, it covers so many issues and it really makes you think like you know what is it? I'm, what are the actions I'm taking in my life going to do to the people in the future? Because you realise that even the smallest thing you do kind of ripples out across time, and it, it's a really intense experience once you get to grips with the film. I think. I don't know why, but some of that has made me think of Life of Brian. I don't know what you said that made me think of that, but Life <laughs> of Brian technically is a sci-fi film because there's aliens in it. Yeah. It's when I, I was thinking wanna, of Martha Brian. <laughs> I just want to speak to that as well because sometimes those books or films or whatever it is do, like you say, it helped you with a almost like a philosophy for yourself um, and, and steered you in a particular direction. And like I say, the, the Dark Tower series, the Stephen King series, um, I was really struggling at different points and it took me months to read the whole series because it's it's huge. Like the main books is only seven, but then like say you bring in lots of the other books that Stephen King's written. And 
when I was really struggling, there's a the, they the main gunslinger uses the phrase it's car, which means like K A, and it means what will be what will, will be. It's like water flowing; it just flows, it goes where it wants, and, and and all this kind of thing. And actually, that was really helpful. I was like, it's going to be what it's going to be. I've just got to get through and stop trying to focus too much on those things. And that was really. Shit quite happened. useful for me at that point in time not quite shit happens it was more less about um destiny and more about just going with things as they stand if you can't do anything at that point in time kind of thing so it was yeah it was really helpful um libby's also saying disney films so things like treasure planet and wally like wally definitely oh. is sci-fi oh raven you're on mute just thought of something I can't believe we haven't mentioned. Kurt Vonnegut, Slaughterhouse Five. Oh yeah, yes. Um, Slaughterhouse Five is one of the weirdest books I've ever read in my life. I think it doesn't. It doesn't really exactly have an ending. It kind of just stops. <laughs> it's um. I, I've I've thought of, I've thought about that book a lot, and like the um, like the main character gets ta like basically gets taken and put at one point taken and put in an alien zoo, um, and kind of kind of in, inverts the inverts a lot of things in 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 your head. It's a really strange book. The alien zoo has made me think of um, Solar Opposites. I think it's on Disney. It's um, kind of similar to um, Rick and Morty, but it's by one of the same people, where the family of aliens land on the planet and they're obviously getting on with everyone. But um, these two, the two children, they shrink down people and put them in their little menagerie of shrunken people. And there's this whole storyline of them rising up to get out of their zoo. Oh, Ben says that they've only just noticed R2-D2 on Tigger's desk. Can we see R2-D2, please? And Sai, I don't know if you can... Look at R2-D2. Can't you do the noise or something? Isn't it you... Oh, my God. Uh, and that you do that noise, don't you, for, like, the stimminess. Yeah, I do. And, and when, I do, when I don't want to... Um, when I choose not to use my spoken words, I have his phrases, her phrases, their phrases... Um, like when I've lost things or I'm anxious or I'm upset, definitely. Because again, you know, what, how old was I when Star Wars came out? 12, 13, 12, I think. Massive impact upon my life and, and another great place to hide myself. Um, so no, I love R2D2. Ben mentions that um, a huge, huge part of loving sci fi is the collections and collectibles. And yeah, if I wasn't very ADHD in my. Um, Object permanence was so trash. I'd be living in a museum of just star, mostly Star Trek collectibles. But I've got um, go on. I'll show you since you're asked. I was going to say, do you want to show us? And then Ben's oh. going to show us. So we've got like people this. who can't see the screen. Sai is currently showing us lots of their Star Trek models, which Tigger is just not looking at because they're like, it's too beautiful. <laughs> And then we've got Ben showing us, um, of course, Sai has got a lot. We've got Ben showing us their Marvel, um, Captain Marvel, no, Captain America shield and all of their Funko Pops, which are screen, pretty much all Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a close up of Ben's eyeball. I think this is it as well. We become part of that, that those worlds, don't we, by collectibles. Um, I've only been to one like Comic Con type thing by the sea, but there's so many people, oh, there's a little baby group, and um, there's so many people who are obviously neurodivergent going to Comic Cons and like dressing up. Um, like I say, I wanted so much when I was younger a Dave Lister, the last human being alive, red dwarf um, bomber jacket with the red dwarf stuff that he had on. He had like patches and things like this. So I'm making it kind of myself. I say myself. I'm getting somebody else to do the sewing um, now. So I've got like 
I ordered um, a Red Dwarf mining patch. I've got a Starbug, so one of the little spaceships that they use, patch. Um, I've got, because Lister is literally like the bottom of the pile in terms of um, rank. He only just outranks the ship laboratory mice, he says. Um, and so I've got like Lister, third technician, with his one little pip that's going to go on the jacket. I'm very excited. I think the community aspect, though, that's we probably should have talked about that a bit more, really, shouldn't we? Because that's probably one of the nice things about science fiction for neurodivergent people is that it's a, we can socialise but still, it's completely normal to socialise at a convention and just info dump about science fiction, like your favourite science fiction. If you're, if you're at like a, a science fiction event and all you want to talk about is science fiction, no one's going to be like, you've been talking about this for too long, you need to talk about something normal, because it's completely normal at like conventions and stuff. Absolutely. And it does. It break, We're allowed to nerd out and we find other fellow nerds and it's beautiful. Um, I just want to also flag some things that Libby has said. So um, this is like it's June is very important oh. to Libby. And so Libby's got a quote here. It says fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. June mantra about acknowledging and letting emotions flow. And I think that's quite lovely. And I, I wonder how much that's useful for you, Libby, because you, I know, experience quite a lot of anxiety, like many of us as autistic people. Um, and then Libby's next comment is, I watch sea beams glitter in the dark near the Tannhauser Gate. All those moments will be lost in time, like tears in rain, time to die. So I think they're just some lovely um, quotes as well that Libby enjoys. That bit still, that bit gets to me so much. That line, and that can, you know, when I've watched the whole thing, and, and you know, boom, emotionally, I find that an absolutely beautiful. Both of them, beautiful lines. I think that's what non-sci-fi lovers don't get to appreciate that these beautiful quotes and stories that you can have in sci-fi it can be so deep and meaningful oh i'd like to see what ben's comment is um i'm just gonna flag because i asked right at the start for people so side do you want these this was um i think i was asking why people love sci-fi so there's just a few Want to read this one, Si? Uh, for me, it's because I find imagination very difficult and others are so good and it's enjoyable. That's Anushka. It can be a form of escapism, definitely. And from Andrew. This was Ben's original one. Wow. Marvel integrates the super from the normal very seamlessly. Not suddenly expecting everyone to see someone fly and not really care, but to slowly over time get used to it through the cinematic universe, which allows growth of the characters and almost following the world in real time over a decade and still going as they adapt to the rise of superheroes and advanced tech, etc. It tries to give a reasonable explanation for everything, which makes it plausible. I think that was also in, in comment back to me when I was like, what realism is there in Marvel? <laughs> Very much. Um, Wayne Atwood, I like sci-fi as it allows me to escape into thousands of other worlds where I feel safe, except for the Tribbles. <laughs> What's a Tribble? Uh, they're from Star Trek. They're just this little, faceless, um, limbless, fluffy thing. <laughs> but, uh, I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, please, and not many people know this, but this is going out live now. So the whole world is going to find out. When I was a youngster, I snuck into, I think, Wolverhampton Town Market. 
and I got furry fabric and I got stuff you fill it with and I made my own triple <laughs> at the age of I don't know. Oh no, people are gonna realise now, but I made my own triple and I used to I used to have it with me in various places. That's a true story. Just make sure I you drop my own it. triple. <laughs> You can get them now, and they like I know. Sort of twitch and vibrate and make these cute little squeaky noises. And what did Someone Rachel say? Missed. I missed it. I said, just make sure you don't feed the triple. Oh, <laughs> I won't. I didn't. And that makes me think of Gremlins. Somebody else said Gremlins earlier as well. Like Grem Gremlins has definitely got to be sci-fi, right? Sort Alan of. Kind of magic. Okay. I think sci-fi empowers us as ND people to live in a different moment and be creative to the extreme. Ben, he's here. Also, a favourite part of sci-fi for me is the technology. I love seeing all the different designs of spacecraft. Yeah, I get, I get really into that. I can get lost. I watched a few um, uh, YouTube things where they just this guy talks about all the different um star trek crafts the spaceships and what they can do and stuff it's really nerdy <laughs> it's brilliant wayne. i love this thanks for this wayne i'm gonna read it i'm gonna read it i'm gonna read it oh, well, so wayne says the first <clears> series <throat> of red dwarf actually the first two series are my favorite like the rest are okay, but the first series when they had really terrible sets and like you could see people in the background like pushing the doors closed and stuff like that. The comedy was just genius. Um, so the first series of Red Dwarf, Holly, who was the um, hologram, and they literally employed that actor because they were very deadpan. And Holly is like, emergency, there's an emergency going on, it's still going on, um, and things like, Dave Lister has come out of stasis after three million years because they had to wait for the radiation levels to get really low, um, comes out and Holly's trying to tell him that the whole crew are dead um, and that he's the only human being left ever. Um, and it's just like, what, Peterson's dead? And he's like, they're dead, Dave. Everyone's dead, Dave. Um, and they just keep going and so he's just like, oh, I should have never got him out of stasis. Why didn't Holly <laughs> see that black hole? Oh, because <laughs> the thing about space <laughs> is it's black. And the thing about black holes is they're black. And, and so, <laughs> so she doesn't notice it. <laughs> oh my God, I love Red Dwarf so much. Just so excited. <laughs> Did I ask the final question? I think there's two that would be quite <clears throat> good actually. Because there's the one about the spaceship. What's, what's yeah, Ben's is good. Yeah. If you could fly in one spacecraft from any sci-fi universe, what would it be? David? Mine would be the Red Dwarf. I think... It's the most ridiculous, chunky, ridiculous line, spaceship. I think if I had to pick... I would pick the Enterprise C, which I know only appears in that one episode of The Next Generation. But... Out of all the Enterprises, I think that the Enterprise C has the most graceful lines. I love the Enterprise C. It's my favorite. For people who can't see the screen, Sai is currently showing us the Enterprise C, I'm assuming, yes. um, model that they have. From yesterday's Enterprise. Yeah. Yesterday's Enterprise is one of the best episodes of The Next Generation, I think. I so think... If you need more space in your house, just send and models this way, really. Please do. One, one of the reasons that I love the Enterprise C is that it's the only Enterprise we ever see that um, has a female captain, Captain Garrett. Yes. I think I'm going to have to go very stereotypical here, but it's the Millennium Falcon for me. Because... It's just, I've got so many memories associated with those films. And, like, it, the thought of, like, being on the Millennium Falcon with Chewie by my side, like, punch it, Chewie. Like, it just makes me smile every time. Is it because it can do the Kessel run in 14 parsecs? We don't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Paco, um, great. That's a lot of talking in that. 
is, yeah, a steaming pile of hotspur. That's from Which Red you Dwarf. wouldn't get unless you've watched Red Dwarf and you actually know British um, football teams. <laughs> it's so random. The Ben ship would be um, from the Guardians of the Galaxy, the Milano or the Benatar, if I could give it a paint job. They are both beautiful ships. I do prefer the Milano. I'm just disappointed that your T-shirt, Si, doesn't have Red Dwarf on it or the Starbug. So I actually would also say, so Star, uh, um, Red Dwarf ship, but also the TARDIS, because obviously you can go anywhere and anywhere. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of stuck on the Enterprise and the TARDIS as well, and, I, and then the original Enterprise. I would um, pick the Enterprise D. I think my other picks for sci-fi ships I'd want to fly would be um, the Serenity from Firefly, oh, and then yeah. also, um, and then oh, also cool. the Rosinante from um, the Expanse. Look at that beauty! Can I just say I'm really disappointed in us now that we haven't talked more about Firefly. Literally, yeah. one of the best there's so many, this is the thing sci fi, there's so many, and there's so many amazing. Yeah, Firefly. Firefly is somewhat tainted by the fact that it was made by Joss Whedon. Mm. But aside from that, I really love it. I just want to say, I, I have every single variation of the Enterprise except for the original. The original, and I'm really good because the company that makes them has now gone into liquidation. They don't make them anymore. So uh, I have every single one, Incl including the Kelvin. Very sad. I'm trying to find my one terrible joke that I know. Okay, terrible joke from Firefly. It probably still hurts. Um, are you ready? How do Reavers clean their spears. Oh, God. They put it through the wash. <laughs> it still hurts. <laughs> it still hurts. Ben's like, I have no idea what's going on. Okay, <laughs> there's a character called Wash. Reavers are like these just evil Reavers that are like... Space madness, basically. Yeah. And they put their spear through Wash. And we still do not forgive them for killing yeah, him. Yeah, that, that was in the film. They killed him off quite early, didn't they? Yeah. Yep. Do not forgive. I can't remember the actor's name, um, but he's in a lot of stuff. He plays a lot of... Um... Alan Tudyk. Alan yeah, Skudik. 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 Uh, something like that. But he plays a lot of... He does a lot of voice voicing for characters. Something else I don't forgive. Cancelling alphas on a cliffhanger. Yes. I am Ow. with Sheldon Cooper in ringing up and finding out what was wrong and what, what the director thought they were doing and what they were cancelling alphas. I can't remember the name of the character, but he's very clearly coded autistic and played very well, I think. The guy it's not even coded autistic. They are... They well, say I think he is. Yeah, I think he, he is. is autistic, yeah. Oh, autistic. Um, yeah so I can't think of alphas without thinking of Eureka and Warehouse 13 because they're all set in the yeah. same universe. But then I get angry because in Eureka, the, they have a black autistic character who they cure through time travel. I, oh. I don't like that at all. I've never whereas, actually seen because Eureka. Whereas alphas... Jasper, stop knocking things down. I don't know what you just knocked off. Whereas alphas, 2011-2012... I discovered the term neurodiversity in about 2012. They used the term neurodiversity in alphas in 2011-2012. Um, so you've got the main or uh, one of the main characters, the alphas, they've all got these sort of superhero powers of some description. And one of the characters is an autistic guy who he can like basically pull and see um, like electronic waves and internet waves and things like that out of the sky, out of the air and read them. Um, but even more interestingly, one of the villain characters is a non-speaking autistic woman and she's trying to fight for neurodiversity. And they cancelled it. 
on a cliffhanger where pretty much everyone's dead and you're like what did you do why did you do that because that was amazing for 2011 2012 to have show. two autistic characters and a non-speaking female autistic character i'm still angry yeah <laughs> i still can't believe the council of sarah connor chronicles I'm still angry about that. I never got over Blake Seven. <laughs> I was young. It really hurt at the time. And the last one, just so that we've listed lots of things if people haven't seen them that they could potentially go and find and get immersed in. Um, misfits. British, gritty misfits. A bunch of literal misfits. They are... Um, community service youth um, and they get hit by this weird storm as do a number of other people across the globe and end up with um, superpowers and but it's it's not shiny it's really gritty and it's just amazing I think that's all the ones I wanted to talk about so I'm happy apart from Bill and Ted I'll just mention flag Bill and Ted sci-fi it's amazing <laughs> too many to mention. They're all going off in my head now. All the different sci-fi series. Is, is, is. But we should end with what is your current favourite or new stim? We know what David is. <laughs> well, that's what he's today. I found one of my zipper bracelets again recently, and since since then it's been that. I just this this I, blue tack I dropped on the carpet, okay. moved my chair, and I had to work really hard to get the blue tack out of the carpet. That was a real disaster. So now, if I'm not holding a presenter or something, I find myself doing this, and this is a new one for me, really, at such high speed, and that's my latest. Yeah, I love it. It's like I do love. like I do like wiggling and tapping my fingers. This is when I get to double check if the people do it the same way that I do. Are you a double tapper on the on the return? Um, or is no. it Ben's saying yes? So I'm a double tapper. You have to dab because you're going back. You're going the other direction, so you have to do a double tap. I go one direction and then just start again. The Ben's new steam is bouncing his pecs. So for it's people who can't see Ben, they are currently <laughs> this like beefed up potato superhero wearing a. a, a they basically look kind of like a Superman potato with a P. <laughs> and they've got ridiculous pecs. Raven's showing there, either friend or partner. <laughs> Mine was. I mean, I'm still really into doing my nails. Um, but since last week, I, well, it wasn't my fault. Octavia, being an octopus, she wanted to get to the water. So she jumped in my big mug of coffee. Um, and now she smells of coffee. So I'm just always smelling Octavia. Uh, Octavia is a little like beanie baby octopus. She's very cute. She's very sassy, but she's also very grim now because she's been chucked in the pot of coffee. Oh, Paco. Seriously, some people are just reminding me of some amazing things. I know we're onto the stimming oh, one, but just in case, sliders was epic as well that was an amazing amazing series travelers is a good quite fairly recent um series free series and um, they would send people from the future and they would get downloaded into, into people that were about to die and so they all took over their body basically and were trying to prevent catastrophe their apocalypse <laughs> Ben's still <clears throat> wiggling their pecs in case anyone <laughs> can't see. Ben has said, I robot. <laughs> that was Philip K. Dick Asimov. as well, wasn't it? Uh, Asimov. I unfortunately have to hop off here. Yep. We're it just has wrapping been lovely up, talking right? to you all. Farewell. Lovely. Bye. Bye. I think that's it. We're good. Uh, probably. Have we got no Everyone's other just questions? Got a I mean, we could do my story. <laughs> Save it. <laughs>
save it. <laughs> but it's very relevant. Okay, go on then, if it's a relevant one. Well, I mean, you don't have to read it out. You might want to, though. Okay. You know, when it's cold outside, there's no kind of atmosphere. You're all alone, more or less. You want to fly far away from here to have fun, fun, fun in the sun, sun, sun. You want to lie shipwrecked in comatose, drinking fresh mango juice, goldfish shoals nibbling at your toes. Fun, fun, fun in the sun, sun, sun. Fun, fun, fun in the sun, sun, sun. You pack your bags and head into hyperspace where you'll succeed at time warp speeds. Spend your days in ultraviolet rays. Fun, fun, fun in the sun, sun, sun. The end. Wait, are you sure? There's another one. We'll lock oh. on course straight through the universe. You and me, the galaxy. Reach the stage where hyperdrives engage. Fun, fun, fun in the sun, sun, sun. Fun, fun, fun in the sun, sun, sun. Um, and for people who aren't aware, that's Red Dwarf. <laughs> The end. The end. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Awkward wave. Keep waving. <laughs>